In this 10-year anniversary edition of Nintendo Unboxed, we're going to be taking a look at the Family Computer, or Famicom. If you're interested in seeing my original unboxing video for this console, you can go ahead and click on the link to it in the description for this video. But right away, we can see we've got the typical family computer aesthetic with the red text on a silver background and a photo of the product placed prominently on the front. We've got the console model number here, HVC001. And the family computer actually did have a little bit of a stylized logo going on that was used. Things that were part of the Famicom family of products. And up here, the title, we've got a little bit of a description here of what would be included in the box. So we'll see those components once we get the lid off. And then the title here is uh, presented in both Roman characters and kanji and katakana. And then that Nintendo logo that um, we weren't quite as familiar with yet or familiar with at all in the United States. This was 1983 when this was released. The closest Nintendo had come to uh, producing a home video game system were those TV game uh, uh, Pong clone consoles. We took a look at one of those in one of my previous unboxing videos for the TV Game 6. So this was uh, Nintendo's first foray into the TV home console market as far as a proper console goes with interchangeable cartridges. And speaking of those cartridges, on the long side panel here, as was a typical design uh, a cue for the family computer line of products, we have a nice color photo here of the family computer surrounded by several of the different multicolored cartridges. They wanted to kind of send home the message that, yeah, this isn't uh, your standard Pong clone console that just has variations of one game. This offered a whole different experience where you could swap out the cartridges and play several different unique games. So those are the cartridges, or cassettes, as they were commonly uh, called in Japanese. As we turn it over to the short panel here, we've just got the branding in text along with a little bit of information here about the family computer family of products here. But then here you see the copyright of 1983. Those design cues and photos repeat on the other long and short sides. And on the bottom, we just have a block of styrofoam that was uh, pretty standard as far as the Famicom and Super Famicom products were concerned in regards to their packaging. Everything was kind of protected within a styrofoam block, and it was just covered by an outer cardboard case. So as we remove that cardboard case, we see what was included with the original family computer, or Famicom. We'll take a look at the documentation first. Several things included in this bag of documents. We'll start off with the very unique manga instruction booklet. One thing that I really enjoyed about the Famicom and disc system accessory and maybe some other things. I'm not sure. I haven't seen manga outside of the Famicom and disc system uh, pieces of hardware by Nintendo. But they included a manga, which is kind of a kid-friendly version of the more technical instruction manual that was also included. And we'll take a look at that. But I believe that the purpose of the manga was to uh, be kid-friendly and present pretty much all of the same information in more of an engaging story format. And this goes into a tremendous amount of detail, right down into some pictures of what the internals look like. Because I know as uh, when I was a kid, I loved trying to take things apart and seeing what they looked like inside. And eh, that's not always the best practice uh, if you, you know, care about your... Uh, electronic uh, equipment working so I think they wanted to try to eliminate that temptation for kids in the manga and of course explain to them how it works but it opens up with a story it looks like of a boy who might be attracted to a girl the story continues on and probably eventually ends with them playing Famicom together 
So I'm not going to go through and spend lots of time on the manga here, but what I will do, like I did in my original unboxing video, is I will uh, put scans of this manga at the end of the video so you can watch them. Oh, and yep, there is the, the diagram of the internals of the system there. So, lots of, and even a cartridge. They take a cartridge apart for you as well. Very technical in this kid-friendly storage. <laughs> Talking about picture processing unit and the CPU. Wow, this really gets into the nuts and bolts of how things worked. But we can see that the story of the boy and the girl continues on throughout the manga here. Really, really neat way to present the information to kids who were pretty much the target audience for the Famicom. So that's the manga, and again, I will put scans of it at the end of this video so you can see it in more detail. Also included, like I said, was a pretty standard instruction manual here. So here we've got Famiri Computer, so Family Computer, HVC001. Again is the part number, and then the kanji for the word Nintendo. Interesting that they use the kanji for the word Nintendo here in the manual, and then they have their stylized logo on the box. You'll probably see that kind of interchanged between several of the things that we take a look at here. But opening up the manual, yeah, lots again, uh, again, lots of those technical specs not presented in nearly in an engage as in an engaging way as the manga. But they are showing you how to um, hook up some of the uh, peripherals, such as the family basic keyboard and then the zapper gun, both of which would go into a front EXT port because the controllers on the Famicom were actually hardwired. You could not detach them unless you took the system apart. Um, and even then it would require some know-how and some uh, you know, extra length of cord and knowing how to splice things together to make them longer or even detachable. So they were meant to stay connected to the system and any other peripheral you wanted to use would interface with the front EXT port. Then it goes on to show you how to hook this up to your TV via the supplied RF or radio frequency switch. And we'll take a look at the one that was included with this one. And this is one of the rare pieces of um, Nintendo uh, hardware that included an AC adapter. Many uh, pieces of hardware uh, from Nintendo, starting with the Super Famicom, I believe, did not supply those. You had to buy them separately because I think a lot of, I think they were figuring that, hey, you already own a, a Famicom, most likely. You're upgrading to a Super Famicom. You can just use the same AC adapter. And we're actually starting to see that now here in the United States with cell phones. A lot of cell phones aren't coming with the brick because there are so many in the environment already. So, actually, a smart move. All the different ways that you could hook the RF switch up to the TV. Not going to see any HDMI here for sure. Not even going to see composite video. This was released in 1983 when radio frequency was pretty much the norm for any sort of external peripheral. And I already explained a very rudimentary way of how that worked. Radio frequency broadcast over a particular TV channel. So it's not a direct connection necessarily like composite or HDMI. And as a result, your sound quality and your video quality suffer. Definitely not the... Uh, the uh, best quality with that connection there. But yeah, again, lots and lots of text and some diagrams, even going as far as to how to strip your coax cable, I guess. And um, uh, I don't even know why you would need to know this. I've never had to make any modifications to any of the coaxial cables I've used for making video connections. But hey, that information is in this manual. They go in much, much detail, even in the kids' manga. So that is the standard instruction manual. And one other thing of note, it looks like this one that I have has a stamp on it, probably the stamp from the store from which it was purchased. Um, a lot of times I think uh, you could write down the telephone number for the store, or, you know, the supplier where you bought it from, and maybe call them up for technical service. Uh, that might have been what all this information was for on the back panel.
But one thing that is also uh, pretty typical of these Nintendo products is there's a sticker with the serial number on the back and then the actual hardware itself is going to have that same serial number sticker on it. So for collector's purposes you'd want to make sure that your serial numbers on your console and then on the instruction manual are uh, that, that they match. You wouldn't really want a mismatched instruction manual. And we've got a little bit of a warning sheet here, something to do with the AC adapter. Another warning sheet, not really sure what this means. It's all in, uh, this is in hiragana and katakana and kanji, and then there's the word Nintendo at the bottom. And then another sort of warning or information sheet, it's pointing out here the EXT port for some reason. Yeah, expansion Connecto. I think it's like Expansion Connect down here. I'm not sure why they're pointing it out in this little leaflet when it was already mentioned, but if you speak Japanese and can clue me in at all to what this one is talking about, let me know in the comments. I'd be curious. So that's all the documentation that was included with the Famicom. Let's take a look at the first connection here, the AV connection. This is the RF cable. Let's take it out of the bag here. And this kind of RCA style plug will plug into the back of the Famicom. And then this uh, style cable will plug into the TV. This will connect uh, to the coaxial input. And then if you need any sort of adapter to make that connection happen, uh, that's what these screws are for. Nintendo also included this little adapter here. Not entirely sure what this is for. It says 300 ohms, I think is what that symbol is. And then it actually does have the family computer family logo on it. So that's interesting. This is branded a branded uh, adapter here. I'm not sure if you would in, um, plug that on here for some reason in order to make the signal any better, but again, if you know more a lot about electronics than I do, uh, let me know what this, what, uh, what this is here. So this was included by Nintendo. But this is your RF adapter, like I said, radio frequency broadcasting over a channel. In Japan, it would be either channel one or two. So uh, you would get your picture and audio, a little bit of a f a little bit of a fuzzy connection with the RF, but that was the best that they were doing in 1983. Then we've got our AC adapter brick, nothing too special there, and both of those would plug into the back of the Famicom. So this is it. Quite a curious design here. Much like the uh, Super Nintendo Entertainment System and the Super Famicom, a lot of these um, Famicoms are starting to yellow. Um, it always was kind of an off-white color. This was never like a very bright, pure white. It was always kind of an almondy white with the maroon color, that uh, kind of dual color scheme. But as these age, you can tell there's a little bit of yellowing that goes on. But what you would get here is your family computer console. The cartridge slot actually has a little bit of a desk cover flap that you would have to lift up and replace when you were done. Your cartridges would load in the top. And then there's actually a little bit of an eject lever or slider right here. And so you can get an idea of how that would work. I have a Famicom cartridge here. This is Devil World. So what we would do is once you get the dust cover open, you just take your cartridge and, of course, insert it in by pushing down. Now, there's no reason why you can't just remove the cartridge with your hand. And as a matter of fact, uh, it wasn't really all that difficult. I think one of the reasons that Nintendo included eject mechanisms on the Famicom and Super Famicom may be because of how, in my opinion, and in the opinion of some of my friends as well back in the day, how difficult it was to remove Atari cartridges. I mean, you didn't struggle, but it certainly wasn't the easiest experience. So I think maybe just to make it all that much easier, they included the eject. And before I show you how that works, I'll show you what's going on in here. 
as you can see right down in there there's a little piece of plastic that repre uh, that rests or actually that this part of the cartridge sits on and what it does is since it's in the shape of a triangle it acts as kind of a wedge and as you push the uh, eject lever up you can see that the piece of plastic also moves up it kind of you know goes up that um, goes up that angle of the triangle shape and then on both sides that's going on on both sides here that pushes the cartridge out of the system so you've got your cartridge inserted push up and then the cartridge is removed easily but not all that much more easily than just pulling it out with your hand which you certainly could do we've got some warning or informational labels here on the side for your power switch you turn that on there's a little bit of an orange sticker there no LED on this particular version to let you know that it's on just the orange sticker and then the reset button that pushes down so you can restart your game here along the front we've got the family computer logo and the Nintendo logo as well as the Famicom family logo here you've got your EXT port it's currently got the cover on it but if I remove that it's got a several pin connection there for things like your family basic keyboard or the zapper gun uh, those are some of the things we saw in the instruction manual and the reason we needed this EXT port is because the controllers are part of the system here. I mentioned already they were hardwired. If we turn this around to the back here, you can see where they come out of the console. So uh, definitely not going to be going anywhere too far. And uh, there's a couple reasons for that, I believe. Uh, the main reason was just a, uh, a cultural difference between uh, Japan and the United States. The controller wires we got for the Nintendo Entertainment System were much, much longer because uh, at that time, and still to this day, even though we don't have wired controllers like we used to, um, we would put our video game consoles on an entertainment center that was set back far from the couch or sofa that we were sitting on. So uh, we needed the longer controller wire. However, as you can see here with the Famicom, <laughs> the controller wire is not long at all. And the thought behind that was is that the console is pretty much going to be sitting next to you while you're seated on the floor in front of your TV. So what you actually have are very long cables for your RF switch that would plug into the back. So you could take the console off your TV or off a shelf, put it down on the floor next to you, and then have it right next to you as you play. So that's why we see the very short cords in the hardwired system. However, Nintendo, once the Super Famicom would come out, they would make one change there, but still kind of stick with the short controller wire. And that change was having detachable controllers. The Super Famicom does have that, but they still have the short wires. So as we take a look at the controller here, it looks very similar to the Nintendo Entertainment System controller. Um, one of the main differences is that uh, it's very curvy. We always say that uh, the NES controller was sharp and after many hours of gameplay would become painful to play because that corner was kind of digging into the palm of your hand, but that's certainly not the case with these controllers. They're very rounded and one of the reasons for that is this lip that kind of runs around the edge of it and that's so that it can seat inside the console and by having that lip you can't pull it forward you can only pull it up and out there but you have your d-pad select and start and a and b buttons and something of a collector's note some of the very first versions of the famicom i believe had square b and a buttons and they were also rubber instead of hard plastic rubber like the select and start buttons but I believe since they're used so much and intensely during gameplay that they wore out and that was a, a design flaw that Nintendo realized early on so they changed it too I don't know why round but definitely I understand why plastic instead of rubber
The other thing that you notice is that the controller wire comes out the side, which is interesting. We were always used to having it come out the top, which makes more sense to me because you kind of have to find a way to get the wire to go between your fingers as you hold the controller. But once you get used to it, that's not that big of a deal. But you see this controller is clearly marked as Roman numeral one or player number one because along the other side, we've got the controller for player two. And this one actually does look quite a bit different than the first player controller. As you can see, there's no start and select buttons. I guess uh, they figured that uh, the responsibility of starting the game and selecting the one player or two player option would fall to the person who had the first player controller. So what we have on this one is a microphone, which is uh, very interesting. Uh, there's also a volume slider for that. And uh, the microphone wasn't used all that much. It was a feature that they did not carry over to the Super Famicom or even the redesigned Famicom AV, which I've taken a look at in Nintendo Unboxed and, of course, we will revisit in the 10-year anniversary here. But uh, the microphone feature wasn't used uh, too much. The most uh, notable time that it was used was for The Legend of Zelda, when you had to scream into the microphone to make the loud noise that one of the creatures disliked, and then that would help defeat that creature. But that is the two-player controller, or player two controller. Also rests in the console just like the other one. Take them out so that we can turn the unit over here. On the back, not too much of note. Um, we've got this kind of maroon aesthetic going on here, the off-white on the top and the maroon on the bottom. The serial number sticker that I mentioned that should match the serial number on the sticker of your instruction manual. We'll take a look at mine. We've got 1621400, so those do match. And then the other thing that I want to point out is kind of a collector's note. Much like for the controller, those rubber square B and A buttons, I believe some of the very first Famicom consoles had a smooth bottom panel here. This has kind of a texture on it. So that's just a little bit of a design variation to be looking for if you're in the market to pick up a Famicom. So there you have the Family Computer, or Famicom, released in 1983 in Japan by Nintendo. I hope you enjoyed this unboxing and will stay tuned for all of the other content that I have coming at World of Nintendo, especially the redone unboxings as part of my 10-year anniversary celebration of the Nintendo Unboxed playlist. You might uh, be aware that I am reshooting several of those in an attempt to improve some of the video quality there. So take a look at the upcoming calendar and definitely stay tuned after this video if you're interested in seeing the scans of the manga manual.